Thank you, Lynette. Uh, welcome, everybody. And I'm excited about the program today. Um, uh, Claire Lockhart is going to give our program. I can remember Claire over in the over in the art department and when she was a student at SDSU. And then a few years ago, she had an exhibit over at the Ritz Gallery that um, I was really, it was it's called A is for Aprons, uh, was the name of her exhibit. And I was really impressed with it. But she considers herself a feisty artist. And also, you know, she has the title of Miss Art World South Dakota. And one thing is, is that she likes to incorporate humor to make serious subjects approachable. And uh, she, as I said, she went to SDSU, she received her BS degree uh, from SDSU, and she received her MFA from the University of South Dakota. So I'd like to introduce Claire Lockhart. So thank you so much for spending your time with me. I am Claire Lockhart, and as you can tell by my glorious sash, Miss Art World South Dakota. I'm so happy that I have the opportunity to talk about my artwork and my projects here in the South Dakota Art Museum. Now, those of you who know me personally or follow me online, probably understand that I am in the middle of about a thousand different projects. Now, I was told I had a time limit today, so I'm going to try to keep it down to just three main topics. First of all, I want to talk about my role as Miss Art World South Dakota. I also want to share some historic looking paintings. And finally, I want to talk about my paintings of dudes in man caves. <laughs> As I said, I am Miss Art World South Dakota. I will not shut up about it because, I mean, if you had this sash, wouldn't you wear it all the time too? <laughs> but I received my title at a coordination in Women's History Month this year, so during March at the newly renovated Knutson Theater in Vermilion, South Dakota. And in preparation for this honor, I, I go over the top on a lot of my art projects and the gown I'm wearing was, I made and designed it, but I also created the print that is on it. So I tend to make things way more complicated than I need to, but that's part of the fun. Now, I did not invent the concept of Miss Art World. I was bestowed with my title by the original Miss Art World. She is an amazing conceptual artist from Los Angeles, and her name is Catherine Cooksey. She created the concept of Miss Art World to be able to interact within the world of art and navigate those spaces as a woman. And she wrote, Champions for Social Change. The Miss Art World family uses creative activism to inspire thoughtful conversation, cultural advancement, and inclusivity. Feminist, feminine fighters. And even though our artwork differs greatly, she is a performance artist and I'm known for realistic oil paintings. Our goals are very similar. We are advocates for women in the arts and promoting diversity and people who are typically marginalized. So it's exciting that I get to be connected and part of an art movement that stretches across the country. And while I have my, my platform, I like to pretend to give TED Talks since <laughs> No one will accept my application at the TEDx and it's no I'm kidding, but <laughs> I'm really a big advocate for women in the arts because there's that traditional lack of representation. I know many of you who are artists and also women have 
been through a lot of this and understand within the history of Western art, particularly in Europe and then later in the United States, women were traditionally not allowed to study in art schools, academies, apprenticeships, and guilds. And then being able to become a professional artist historically in this tradition was very rare. Of course, there are exceptions to the rule. I mean, we have Artemisia Gentileschi, Sophonis Banguasola, Elizabeth Vigie Lebrun, but those are so rare compared to the opportunities that men artists had. And I know things are better now, but I'm not okay with things being slightly better than it was in the past. In 2019, Chad Topaz did a study and his team discovered that in major American museums and art institutions, only 12.6% of artists were women. Now, I know that artists are stereotypically thought to be bad at math, but I understand about half the population is made of women and 12.6% seems a little lower than 50%. And so it's important for me as an artist to make high quality work and to display it publicly. And I love being able to encourage other artists, especially people who identify as women to be able to display their artwork as well. That 12.6% statistic is embarrassing. And I know it's actually way worse for people of color and non-binary artists too. And so it's important to be aware of that, the art we're consuming and having a variety of voices. Like art in general, we love the idea of creativity and hearing other people's stories and vision. But if we're only displaying and buying artwork from a very, very narrow group of people, we're kind of doing the antithesis of what we want. And so I really do encourage people to be aware of like the demographics of the artists that they are seeing in institutions and galleries and in their own personal collections. So I really love it when people have artwork in their home, of course. And I would encourage all of you when you go home to look around at your collection and do the statistics on what you have personally. I bet you would have better than the national average. So if you walk around your house and you have six paintings and three photographs and a lithograph, and you know that three of those artists were women, well, your statistic is 30%, which is better than the national average, but it still, of course, could be better. And so I want to make sure that I'm not saying like throw away all your artwork made by men. That's a terrible idea. Don't do that. And I'm not saying don't continue to support those artists. But if you notice that the collection you have in your home or where you work or the exhibitions you curate isn't as diverse as you want it to be, just doing that simple statistic can help you encourage yourself to seek out new artists and be exposed to these new perspectives. Like I said, um, thank you for attending my TED talk. <laughs> but the Miss Art World family is a growing art movement. I have a lot of experience as an art teacher. I've taught everything from junior kindergarten through graduate school. And a lot of times students or friends or people I just interact with will ask, well, what era of art history are we in now? Because, you know, modernism was like 1870s through the 1970s and postmodernism probably ended like 20 years ago, depending on which art historian you talk to. And my sarcastic answer used to be, oh, we're in post, 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 post modernism. <laughs> That's a lot. And I don't know. I, I'm not an art critic, but I think I'm just from now on, I'm just going to say I'm in the Miss Art World era of art. And it's exciting because I'm going to bank that in future art history books, there's going to be a whole chapter on Miss Art World. And what's really exciting is that we all get to be part of that era. I know so many people who lament like, oh, I wish I could have been in Paris in the late 19th century and hung out with the Impressionists or wouldn't it be great to be in New York in the 60s and be part of the pop art movement? Well, I haven't figured out time travel, so I'm definitely trying to make the point 
of where I am and the time I'm at an important part in art history. So it's part of a growing art movement. It originated with the original Miss Art World, Catherine Cooksey, and we've added a new Miss Art World. Their title is Mix Art World New York. So we're across the country now. Their name is H.C. Huen, and it's a very exciting time because a lot of this is new. And if you're interested in learning more about Miss Art World or those other artists, there's a website, it's just missartworld.com. And she has a program, it's the Miss Art World podcast. And I've done a couple interviews on there as a guest. So I do recommend checking that out if you're interested in learning more about Miss Art World. But as a multifaceted human being, I have lots of other things to talk about. So I got to be Miss Art World because of the art that I create and how I interact within the art world itself. And the exhibition that John mentioned at the Ritz Gallery was my Feminine Attempt series. And that's what put me on the radar with the original Miss Art World. Now, I paint a lot. <laughs> and in order to have at least some consistency when I'm talking about, I just want to share about artwork that I've made in the last two years. So I have a brand new series of portraits and they are done in a historic academic Western style of painting. And I do this purposefully. I know that I have been dismissed for my paintings because apparently there were some art critics back in the 60s who were like, painting realistic is easy. <laughs> and there's no concept behind it. And I see some people just like, mm. <laughs> I don't know where they got the idea that painting is easy. For me, it is actually very difficult and a challenge. But I'm painting this way purposefully to engage with the history of art. As I mentioned, traditionally in the history in Europe and in the United States, women were not permitted to go to art school and become professional artists. And they weren't allowed to work with live models. It's about a hundred years ago is when women artists were allowed to work with live models and figure drawing. And it was about that time when the art world changed. And it's like, oh, <laughs> we don't paint realistically anymore. That's not avant-garde and cool. And so it's like the minute women got a chance to be able to make that kind of art, the rules had changed and there wasn't that opportunity to excel at that. And so, I, as I said, I don't have a time machine, and but I want my time <laughs> from Leonardo da Vinci up until like the Impressionist, that was the goal to create very realistic looking paintings. And in the hierarchy of art, you have portraits and then you have the historic paintings on top. And so I am purposefully painting in this genre to engage with that history. For those of you that uh, know me, You've probably figured out by now, I do spend a lot of time having arguments with old dead guys. <laughs> anyway, I want to explain why my paintings are realistic and in this more historic looking way. And I really love painting portraits. Not only is it an act of defiance, because traditionally I wouldn't have been allowed to learn how to do this, let alone do it for a living. I love being able to create a portrait that is going to be part of someone's home. They're going to enjoy it. And there's the possibility of it living on for hundreds of years and their great grandchildren finding it, taking it on Antiques Roadshow, finding out they have a whole bunch of money, selling it to a museum, and then they get to be hung up next to the John Singer Sergeants. Possibly. You can tell I think about this a little bit, but <laughs> I enjoy being able to create a portrait. It really makes the people, my subjects, feel important and monumental. And the paintings I'm showing you are from 2020. Now, at the start of 2020, I was very optimistic. I thought, I'm going to make all these paintings, I'll do commissions, I'll have all these art exhibitions. And as much as I like to joke around and kid, I, when the pandemic started in March, 
everything changed. And I don't want to make light of the situation just because of the loss and hardships that everyone had, but I want to, I don't have a good smooth transition out of that to take it back to me, but I, of course, lost a lot of opportunities and income and the one of the biggest problems I had was a lack of access to models because painting people is very important to me, not only from a historic point, but just as an interpersonal relationship way too. So I lost all my access to models. Now, fortunately, I had a few paintings ready to, to start before uh, we started social distancing. And so I was able to create this uh, portrait of Joan. And then I had uh, some children to paint as well. And I just love it when people incorporate their own personality within the painting. So this painting is up in her grandparents' house and it's a classic oil painting, but insisted on wearing her fuzzy Pokemon pajamas <laughs> for it. And I think that is fantastic. I think uh, the parents tried to talk her out of it. She's like, no, I love this. Same with her sister. And I paint in this, like I said, this historic way, this realistic way of painting to engage with the concept of art history. But I also make a lot of paintings and have them ready to go. So that way, in case, you know, there's a director or a curator who does their statistics and they're like, oh, Ooh, we don't have enough women here. Hey, Claire has some paintings. I'm going to give her a call. <laughs> and so whether people are making an exhibition, a temporary one, or adding to their permanent collection, I like to say, I, I'm ready. I've got some stuff for you. <laughs> but after I completed these portraits, I, like I said, ran out of models. And I was being responsible and only working with people in my household. Now, I'm very... Fortunate, I have an amazing, wonderful husband with a great sense of humor who will agree to model for me. And I was also very lucky because I got married just before the pandemic hit. So I got to have someone wonderful to spend the last two years with. And as much as I adore him and would love to spend every day making portraits of Aaron, he's busy and has stuff to do. Also, I think he'd get a little weirded out if all the paintings in the house were him. <laughs> this one's actually hanging up in his mom's house. But I just want to give a quick shout out to his name is Aaron Packard, and he's an amazing photographer. All of the good photos you see of me, he, he makes those. All of the, the bad selfies, those are mine. I'm not a photographer. That's why I got so good at painting. I can't take a photograph to save my life. <laughs> But not only does he make the portraits of me as Miss Art World and other promotional needs I have, but he is also just excellent at photographing artwork. I, I don't know if you've had that struggle with you're at a museum or you're photographing your own artwork, and especially with glossy oil paintings, there's always that reflection. It's always crooked. I can't photograph my own work. And so I'm very lucky to have him be able to create these digital represent, uh, replicas so that way I can share them with you as well. Oh, is this doing a thing again? I don't know if I can get the arrow to show up. He doesn't have text on his forehead, I promise. <laughs> so after he got a little tired of me painting him all the time, I needed to continue to to work and build up my portfolio. And so I ran out of models and decided to pull a Rembrandt and start doing some self-portraits. And I chose not to make, you know, like normal people, regular portraits because that would get old fast. Also, I don't want my house full of portraits of me. That'd be really weird. And so I, of course, made the logical decision and painted myself as a pirate. <laughs> and this series of work I'm showing you is, like I said, it's new. This painting has left my studio to make the photo to put in this presentation. And that one over there is brand new. And they've never been displayed publicly before. So when I said that 
we all get to be part of the era of Miss Our World. <laughs> I, I wasn't actually kidding on that. I'm showing you something new. And if I'm on the right path, you can let me know. If I say something, you're like, oh, Claire, don't put that in your artist statement. Please let me know. <laughs> I really value our art community in South Dakota. One of the nice things about it is, yes, we're a bit more sparse, but that means we can have bigger impact on everything. Sorry. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, I was trying to get the arrow to show up again. I have no idea how I did that that one time. <laughs> yeah, just enjoy the transcript. On the plus side, all of my fumbling now about the transcript will be in the transcript, and that'll be a hoot for future audiences. <laughs> oh, anyway, what I was saying with the, the brand new paintings that I am making and am sharing with people for the first time, it's such a new body work. Like, it's not up on my website yet, and I actually just received a small grant from the South Dakota Arts Council to be able to purchase some supplies to continue in on this series and make a couple frames. But this series of work is very different from how I typically work. I have a big, beautiful art frame. You know, because that MFA. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. But I am very meticulous and research oriented in the work. And when I make other series, I spend a lot of time contemplating what I'm going to do and how it will manifest and spend time traveling and researching and having experiences before I even start the sketches. This series of work is very different from how I typically create. Instead, I started with the paintings. And of course, I have these experiences that are leading into the work, but how I can display it so it's actually considered art. Because if I'm just making a painting, I know we have that history of art for art's sake, but people have been doing that for a while. I need to have a more conceptual basis for my work. And I need to have a meaning behind it because for me personally, that's what separates art from decoration. And while it's fun to have a painting of me as a pirate or flapper, <laughs> I thought the 20s were going to have a lot more jazz and uh, fringe than they did, but I mean, we still have a few years left of the decade. We'll see. But I wanted to have something more meaningful than I know how to paint and check out my cool costume collection. And so as I was creating these paintings, I started making more like different characters from history. And this is where I want to get into the new concept of what I'm talking about. So I like to joke that I'm terminally educated because I have my terminal degree and it leads to my constant existential crises. But as an artist in South Dakota, I think many of you can relate to that. <laughs> and I want to make sure that my artwork is engaging with the history, but it also is contemporary as well. And so my idea for how to display these is going to be different than just hanging up a bunch of self-portraits. Instead, I want the idea of the paintings I hang up, like I want a room with all of my self-portraits where it's through history. And I want not the individual paintings to be the work of art, but I want the installation itself so the environment to be the work of art. And then on top of that, I want to have um, an artist statement. And so this is where you'll have to tell me if this is a good idea or not, because you're in on the joke kind of. In my artist statement, I want to write that I didn't make those paintings. These are all my ancestors. We have a very strong family resemblance, Wink. <laughs> And how convenient is it that they're all the same size, wink, and they are in such good condition. They look brand new, wink, wink. And <laughs> so people who know me or have heard me speak will, will know the joke behind it. But I think it would be fun way, a fun way to engage with an audience where they go in and they see all these paintings that look 
very similar, but the artist statement is saying, no, this is their family. Now, the serious reason behind this work of art that I'm doing is I want to promote the idea of people creating a personal narrative. I also want to address the concept of chosen families and how that is a valid and real family too. But I do like to include my sense of humor with it. So I think it'd be really funny for people to go and see this art. It looks historic. It looks like they're hundreds of years old. They all look very similar. And so I want people to have that bit of confusion. I love embracing absurdity where they're are these really her ancestors or does she just have a fake mustache collection? <laughs> she said they're her ancestors, but they look all exactly like her. Is she an immoral being? Is Claire a vampire? No, no, no. She's a time lord. <laughs> okay, so I hear some giggling. So perhaps I could continue on with this weird idea. Please feel free to let me know. Okay. <laughs> but... As I said, this series of paintings arose out of, I didn't have access to other models. Now, fortunately, uh, with people being vaccinated and learning more of how to be able to live through our current pandemic, I've been able to work with other models again. And so I just want to reiterate that I really love being able to create portraits. And if by chance you realize you just don't have enough art by women and I, I, I've got business cards. We can keep in touch. <laughs> and I was going to make a joke about two. It's kind of like a reverse story in gray. Like, wouldn't it be great? <laughs> Sorry, unrelated. It just reminded me of a friend of mine who said that she can't wait until she gets rich because she's going to pay me to paint her portrait. And then every year she's going to pay me to update her portrait, but to age it like five times faster than her. So by the time she's 50, her painting looks like 130. And so she'll be like, yeah, Claire made this painting in 2025, but look how young I look. <laughs> I think that would be a lot of fun too. And I only have four of the paintings that I uh, completed in 2020 that I was able to get my amazing photographer, Erin Packard to capture for us. And so until the paint dries and I finish a few more, you'll have to make do with my bad cell phone photos and selfies in my studio. <laughs> the last series I want to talk about is my Brodolesque paintings. And <laughs> this is a combination of the word bro and odalesque. I've heard some people pronounce it as odalik too, but it comes from the Turkish word, or excuse me, odalis. It comes from the Turkish word odalek, and that means chambermaid. It's found in a lot of times late 19th century art as part of the Orientalist art movement, but the image of the passive swooning woman on a bunch of cushions is pretty ubiquitous in Western art. And that is what I'm engaging with in this series. <laughs> oh good, you get my sense of humor. <laughs> and I'm making these paintings to address the concept that John Berger made famous in Ways of Seeing, the concept of the male gaze, so G-A-Z-E. And it's just permeating within art history, particularly in the United States and in Europe, where you go to a museum and it's just, ah, there's a nude woman flopped over on a couch. It's art. You can't object to it. It's, it's, it's art with a capital A. And then a lot of times the excuses are invoking truth and beauty and form and a lot of words with capital letters that seem like normal words, but if you take them in the context of philosophy and art history, they mean many different things. And if you question, why is that Lady Newton on the couch? People will say, oh, well, you must not know anything about art, you rube. And it's like, no, I, I studied this a couple times. I make some paintings. It's weird. And the way that I'm pointing out that it's weird 
and unusual is by trying to flip the binary. And so I put masculine men in the same poses that are traditionally considered for feminine models. I'm challenging that notion that men are the artists and women are the models. And if those original paintings that I'm referencing are really truly about form and composition and color and truth and beauty, then my paintings aren't funny. Those are very serious paintings too. This is all about form. If you laughed, you don't know anything. I'm just kidding. <laughs> And I mentioned that I'm referencing the art movement of Orientalism. If it's been a while since you read Edward Said's book, Orientalism, or haven't been too familiar with this topic, I do have a program called The History of Modern Art with Claire. You can find it on about any podcasting platform. So if you, this is a way to search it on Apple Podcasts. It's on Spotify. You can find it on YouTube. And I have an episode specifically on Orientalism because I have a lot of friends who didn't have that same background information. So I put this together so that way they could be able to learn the historic references in which I am talking about. So I have an episode specifically on Orientalism and you can find it on my website as well. And I have the transcript for it if you would prefer to read instead of listen to me talk and all of my resources so if you're interested in some of the, the books and articles I was consulting when I put this together and it's a uh, all in chronological order with the main movements of modern art history and because I'm a very grown-up serious academic I titled the episode Orientalism Cultural Appropriation Odalesques and Aang's Flatulent Hand um, <laughs> it's a quote from Nadar about, oh, uh, you just have to listen. I think it's funny anyway. So I am referencing the, the concept of the woman model being put in museums and on display and objectification, but I'm putting men who are presenting as, you know, bros and a lot of the models are actually artists themselves. <clears throat> and so they get to try out, instead of being the artist, to be the model. But they know that I am very particular in my paintings and I include a lot of tiny details. And it's not just because I hate myself and must torture myself, no, no, no. It's that historic reference when you're looking at artwork by Jean-Léon Jerome, for example, he is making super realistic detailed paintings, realistic in air quotes, to convince the audience that what he saw was true, that he was really there. And so I paint in that way to fight with these old dead guys and also convince you that, no, these man caves are true. Men totally lounge around in their sandals, on their sofa, on a pile of cushions. <clears throat> and I'm very fortunate to be able to have uh, these models who get what my concept is and are willing to pose for me as I paint them like my French girls. Sorry, I had to. Bad Titanic reference. <laughs> and as I said, I could spend all day, every day painting my husband because he's wonderful. And he does let me. So here's some more paintings of him. And one of the really wonderful things is this last year, so for 2021, I was the recipient of a very generous grant from the Elizabeth Greenshields Foundation. It's an international grant for emerging artists. So if you are an emerging artist or know someone, I would recommend they apply for this. It's wonderful. And it's funding me so this year I can create more, paint some more my dude bros. And those paintings are all very new, like they're too wet. I haven't been able to get them photographed yet. And I'm in the process of doing a few of them. So if you follow me on social media, you'll see my progress reports, I guess, my bad selfies. I worry though that I might look self-absorbed on social media, but really I'm just doing it to make provenance for people who work at, you know, the Met and Christie's Auction House down the line. They're going to have a much easier job tracing the history of my art back to me. But <laughs> anyway, 
I've been able to create more paintings. I have a few more planned before the end of the year. And the last painting I'd like to leave you with. <laughs> My husband loves me very much. <laughs> So this is my Brodolesque of Urbino, and <laughs> I, <laughs> I'm glad you're laughing. It is, I, I'm glad that you catch my sense of humor. And one of the details with it is in the, the Titian painting in which I'm referencing, there's a little dog on the bed. And I've never painted a cat before. I'm so allergic to this cat, but that of course means he wants to be around me all the time, especially when I wear black. And I put like cushions and towels, like he loves being on the couch when he's not supposed to be on the couch. And I put treats up there and it's like, he would not, this is the best I could get him to hold still. And then the minute I started tearing down the set, he fell asleep and laid in the perfect pose for like three hours. And I'm like, nope, I'm going to get the surly cat version. That's what you get. <laughs> so I am so happy that I got to come visit the South Dakota Art Museum today. I've really enjoyed spending my morning with you. And I would love it if we could keep in touch. And the easiest way to find me is through my website, clairelockhart.com. On my site, if you go to the about, it'll drop down to contact and you can send me a message that'll go directly to my email. You can also sign up for my mailing list. I don't do a regular newsletter because I'm the type of person that doesn't read newsletters. <laughs> so I won't annoy you and be like maybe a couple email when something cool is happening in your area. So my plans with the, the two different projects I have is in 2022, have my reverse pictures of Dorian Gray <laughs> exhibition up, and then also have another exhibition in the area with my Brodolesque paintings. And so if you want to keep in touch to find, or for me to invite you to those shows, you can sign up for my email. And I also have really gotten into ordering postcards of my paintings and sending those out. So if you would like to receive those a couple times a year, I that's all I would do with your mailing address. Now, once again, I'd like to thank you so much for your time. You have been fantastic. I hope you have a great day. <laughs> Sorry, I got carried away with, oh, my slide said I'm done. But <laughs> as I said, I, I would not mind receiving like feedback on ideas that I have, or if you have specific questions about any of the artwork you saw, like if you're wondering what materials I use, how long it takes, where I work, how on earth do I walk in those boots, anything. <laughs> I am more than happy to, to talk with you. Yes? Do you have a favorite artist? It's so hard to choose. One of my favorite, like for classic historic paint, uh, artists is Artemisia Gentileschi. A few years ago, I was very fortunate and was able to take an art history class in Italy. And in the Uffizi, they have like the Caravaggio room and they have her painting of Judith Slang Hall of Fairness. And this is part of the reason I go on my tirades of there are no women in museums. She was like the only woman in this entire museum. And she paints in the, so she's just like right after Caravaggio in art history. And it's this massive painting and it's so wonderful with the way she renders light and dark and action and drama. And one of the things I really enjoy about her artwork compared to the um, peers she had is that during the Renaissance in Italy, men would paint women with like these little tiny dainty hands. And this is a way that they could figure out some provenance. So like if her dad made a painting, there's a woman holding a lute and it's like balanced on her fingertips because her hands are so pretty, but she's not actually holding the lute. And in Artemisia Gentileschi's paintings, 
the hands are grasping, they're doing, there's muscles activated, and that's this great storytelling. So for traditional or historic oil painters, but then it's like, well, with more storytelling, it's like, oh, well, of course, Frida Kahlo. My, my unofficial biography is when people ask about like my education or where I grew up, I'm like, oh, well, I spun fully formed out of the head of Frida Kahlo. <laughs> I really hope someone makes me a Wikipedia page and puts that on there. That'd be funny. <laughs> Who's your favorite artist then? Yeah. Um, well, unfortunately, I think when you mention who do you have hanging in your home, yeah. <laughs> in your home, I, I have to say they were mostly men. Um, That's okay. You just need to go shopping now. <laughs> it's the holiday season. Treat yourself. <laughs> um, but you, I do have Mary Cassette. Oh, yeah, she's, she is amazing. And part of my appreciation has grown with Mary Cassatt is that that's why I use like feisty in my biography, because I remember reading about her. You probably heard this story where she was painting like a naughty floppy baby and they wouldn't hold still. And a lot of people have the conception that Mary Cassatt is Oh, she's so nice and she paints motherhood and family, but she was rebellious. She wasn't supposed to be an artist. She wasn't supposed to be independent. And her paintings are very against what the canon of what babies were supposed to look like. But I like this story because the, the child was like floppy and being naughty and she yelled at it to stop. And then it cried itself to sleep. And she's like, oh, this is perfect. And then painted the sleeping baby. <laughs> I'm assuming that's not the one you have. I one of a very sad girl. Oh no, maybe that's the one. Yeah, she's not sleeping, so. Oh, that would be hilarious. <laughs> Claire, how did you get started in art? I don't remember where you're from originally. You know, As I said, I was born out of the head of Frida Kahlo. Yeah. <laughs> well, to, to fast forward through some very boring biography things, I actually really never learned how to paint until I went to graduate school because as you know, my career started in education and that prioritizes knowing a little bit of everything. And I got to the point when my teaching certificate was going to expire, so I needed to graduate credits. And I thought, well, might as well get a degree. And I didn't understand how different the academics of art versus the academics of education are and so it was a full-time intensive three-year-long program as opposed to doing classes here and there I mean I know it's intense for an MA in education but it's just totally different and I thought I, it was like undergrad you go to school to learn I didn't understand you were already supposed to be like a professional artist in your field in order to get into a fine arts grad program. So I actually was rejected from everybody the first time. And I like being very public about my trial and error because at heart, in my heart, I am a teacher and I want people to try new things and push themselves. Like as a teacher, it's so weird when people say, I can't take a painting class. I don't know how to paint. And it's like, that's why you take the class. <laughs> and so <laughs> I didn't get into graduate school, but I contacted the heads of the department, asked for feedback on my portfolio. And they gave me a bunch of advice. I did it all. I turned in another embarrassing portfolio, which is why you will not see any of that work. It's bad. But I showed that I can work and I can learn and I can make improvements. And then I was extremely lucky and had some amazing teachers because I had like never painted in oils before 2013. And so it's just a lot of hard work and determination. And also I don't have the attention span to watch TV. So that also helps. <laughs> And just a lot of trial and error. And what I love about painting is it's so forgiving. And I know oil painting for a lot of people is intimidating. But those of you who work in that media, what's so fantastic about it is it dries slowly. So if I screw up, I just wipe it off. If I don't notice the thing I did wasn't good, I can just paint over the top of it. And in a disaster scenario, I'll just sand it back down to the canvas and no one has to know. <laughs> yes. When you uh, decided to do 
Well, about using humor in my work, it's just who I am and it just permeates. It's like I am a big old goofball and if I try to be serious, it doesn't, it's just weird and awkward for everybody. And I've noticed when I am incorporating my humor into my work, it definitely makes it more relatable to my audience and it makes it more approachable because if I make paintings and it's all very serious and it's like women are people and that's it, people will be, will shut down. Or if you say something contradictory, people dig into their prior beliefs. And one of the great things about being an artist is that we can tell stories and communicate and foster empathy in people. And so if people look at my paintings of, you know, the men lounging in their underpants on sofas, they'll laugh and they're like, that's funny, but then consider well, why is it funny? Why is this considered hilarious, but is Olympia is considered fine art and we're just supposed to accept it. And so it's just like this interweaving of what I'm working on and who I am. And like I said, I really do appreciate when I get some feedback on that because sometimes I might think something is funny and sometimes it's like, oh, Claire, don't, don't do that. That's weird. <laughs> yes. Well, you painted so many in 2020. How long does it take you to paint forever? Forever. <laughs> I, that's a, that seems like a lot. Yeah, I really work a lot and my paintings take typically a few months to complete and then hour wise like the just the this is one of the smallest of the bros I had and that's over a hundred hours of work and I also like build my own stretchers and include everything within it and so it is a massive amount of work but as I said I like to go over the top for a good joke <laughs> Because if I didn't do that level of detail, it just, it would fall flat. It wouldn't be as funny. And so I have many more paintings of these men too that I was worried I'd run out of time to share. And so it's just, like I said, I just work a lot to, for the payoff. And I hope that's worth it. <laughs> Claire, yes. Can you on the frame of mind that you were in when you did your pirate. Yeah, I know you were doing ancestors. What brought you to Clara's inheritance? <laughs> so she asked, oh, yeah. sorry. Can you repeat the question? Yes, that's what I was. So she asked about my mindset for. Did you call it Clara the Caribbean? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and why I was doing this pirate. So one of the things with older paintings that I did, that series of those grouchy housewives that was at the Ritz Gallery a few years ago, is my, this is a very specific argument with ancient Greek philosophers. And they have this argument that out of all the arts and all the craftspeople, painters are at the bottom. They're the worst. Because even though they can make a painting that looks like a thing, they don't know how the physical object was actually made and put together. And so they say, a person who can make a chair, that's actually an artist, a painter. They don't know how to make a chair. They suck. And so I want to have an argument with, I think it's Aristotle that developed that. I, correct me if I'm wrong. But I like to make the thing and then put it in my painting. And so it's like, ha ha, take that Aristotle. Not only do I know how to make the painting, but I can make the costume that's in the painting too. And so when I was doing those paintings of the women, I made all the aprons in it. And I made some of the boots that they're wearing too. And that carries over. So like with my pirate costume, I made everything that I'm wearing in it. And so I do like incorporating costume pieces that I have made, and I have a lot of costumes. <laughs> <laughs> so, as I said, I like to be over the top. <laughs> so, 
Any other questions? Well, thank you, Claire, oh, very much. Thank you.